Good afternoon from Ibadan in Nigeria, in West Africa, in Africa. So welcome to my word, that word of politics, history and power. That's my word. So in this class, we will continue from where we stopped. Remember on Monday, we talked about a Buri Accord before the guns began to boom. That was part one. On Wednesday at this same time, we did a Buri Accord part two. In the analysis, the military keeps coming up. We have traced the background to our Buri Accord, so we talked politics. We traced history. And in, continu in continuation of that historic analysis, I have decided to look at the military critically. This time, laying emphasis on the new generation of military officers after the first and the counter coup of 1966. In doing this, I will also take you back to the past. It is about understanding the past for the sake of the future. So what's the topic? Military in power. How General Buhari and his colleagues in the army overthrew Shagari in 1983. It is an interesting story. It is the story of power. My name is Edmundo Pilo. I'm happy you are part of today's broadcast. In the last class, we talked about the Nzogu coup. We talked about the crisis in the western region that contributed to the coup. We talked about unification decree that was initiated by General Agui in Ronse. We'll run through some of those points again for the benefit of those who did not listen. But you have the opportunity to listen to Monday's class and Wednesday's class. Just scroll down this page. This X page, this Facebook page, this YouTube channel, this LinkedIn page. Just scroll down, you will find it. Take your time and listen. And remember, we recommended some books that will help you expand your views of the issues. You can listen to us on State Affairs app. So we are streaming on the app. You can download the app on Google Play Store and Apple Store. Just search for State Affairs with Edmund Obilo. Let's rehearse what we have done during the week. Remember this program runs every Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays at 2 p.m. West African time. The Nigerian military in a bloody operation or operations in bloody operations interfered in politics when young military officers, including Major Kaduna Nzogu, struck on the 15th of January 1966. And what they did was to decimate the leadership of that era. The Prime Minister Tafawa Balewa was taken out. 
Also taken out, we are the Premier of the Western Region, Laduke Akintola, and that of the Northern Region, Amadu Pelo. Top civilian and military officers were not left out in the orgy of death. It marked a new era for Nigeria's politics, and we have not recovered from it. In a radio broadcast announcing Nigeria's first military coup, Major Kaduna Nzogu said the country's enemies are the political profiteers, the swindlers, the men in high and low places that seek bribes and demand 10%. Has anything changed? Has it not gotten worse? Have we learned from the past? Are the politicians of the moment not more corrupt and dangerous? In that broadcast, Nzogu attacked those that seek to keep the country divided permanently so that they can remain in office as ministers of VIP. Didn't we see it in the last election? How some political leaders kept the country divided on the basis of ethnicity? Gang attacks? Nzogu, in that cool speech, condemned the tribalist, the nepotist, those that make the country look big for nothing before international circles. He blamed them for corrupting the society by their words and deeds. Nzogu, in the speech, promised law-abiding Nigeria's freedom from fear and all forms of oppression. Is there freedom from fear? When you are driving on the express and you see somebody in need, do you stop to pick the person? You may want to stop, but there is the fear of her. Who is this? Is this person a kidnapper? Are there no oppressors everywhere in society? The police? The army? The landlord? The tenant? Are we not oppressing each other? It has become a society of oppressors. The government oppresses the people they are meant to lead. Let me quote Nzogu. We promise that you will no more be ashamed to say that you are a Nigerian. <laughs> but I know I'm a proud Nigerian. I have never been ashamed of Nigeria. I know things are not good, but we can make them better. The promise of freedom did not come. As the military found itself in a crisis that snowballed into a civil war, the war followed the bloody county coup of 29th of July, 1966, led by mostly northern officers. You know, we are reminiscing on the past on the past, then we will come to 1983. Now that's the focus. But I'm just trying to brush through what we did on Monday and Wednesday to give you the right background to why the military struck again in 1983. Remember, it's a class of politics and power. I'll be happy to read your comments, your feedback. I'll be happy to know that you are in class. Today we will try to get your voice. That means you can contribute, you can call in. It is public holiday. Relax with us. Relax with this class. Let's talk power. Let's talk politics. Let's talk history. Hmm? I'm not in a hurry. Are you in a hurry? Hmm? Now, Chief Tola Adeni is a renowned journalist. He lives somewhere in Ibadan. He might have other houses, but I know he has a house in Ibadan. And the first time I went to his house to interview him, I discovered he, he named his street 
Kaduna and Zorgo Street. He was the first person to build on that street. And he named it Kaduna and Zorgo Street. I said, oh, ah, so somebody can name a street after Kaduna and Zorgo? I remembered my first time in Okpanam. I wanted to see Nzogu's statue in Okpanam Randabald. I went there. I leapt into it. It was a bit bushy. I stood with the statue and took a shot. Oh, so this is the man. The man who struck in 1966. So let, let's listen to Chief Tola Adini talking about Kaduna Nzogu. To name a street after Kaduna Nzogu. Yes, they didn't, they didn't allow it. The chairman of the council at that time, one Mr. Abasi, was afraid. He was the chairman of the council. He said, no, I can't, can't, I can't handle this. So he went to Jembe, who was the governor. I can't somebody name a street after Nzogu. What was wrong with Nzogu? Exactly. So Did you I ask her? Had my way. I, 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 I put the name there. It was there. Chukuman Zegu Crescent. You left it there? Yes. He's still there? Yes, Chukuman Zegu Crescent. You like him? Of course. I went to Okwanami in 1970 to meet his mother. He killed Amadu Bello. Why should you like him? Oh, come on. The man staged a, a beautiful coup. Beautiful? Yeah. It doesn't Can matter. a coup be beautiful? Of course. That would, they, 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 I mean, they do, they do, they do regime, regime change all over the world. They do regime change all over the world. But that coup led to a devastation, the civil war. It was not well handled. If Zegu had been lucky to be the, the president or the head of state, it would go the other way. It would go be the other way. We would have massacred the leaders. No! Left. Well, Rollins massacred leaders. Uh, Mengistu El Mariam in Ethiopia massacred leaders. They never say, solved the problem of Ethiopia and Ghana, did it? Ghana is a better place than it was before Rollins. Certainly, yes. Certainly, yes. Certainly, yes. Ghana is. No, no, no government official in Ghana would dare steal the way they are still in Nigeria now. No blood. They won't dare. They will not dare. State Affairs with Edmondo Bilo is live. So that's Chief Tola Dini. You know, that interview, I'm still reflecting on that interview. Kadunan Zogu Crescent. You know, Kadunan Zogu, the revolutionary who led a bloody coup against the leadership of the country, who later fought on the side of Biafra in the Nigerian Biafran War. Chief Tola Adini is a renowned journalist, former chairman of the Daily Times, former editor in chief of the Tribune. I want us to reflect on this interview. Let's reflect on it. You were so bold as to name a street after Kaduna and Zogu. Yes, they didn't, they didn't allow it. The chairman of the council at that time, one Mr. Abasi, was afraid. He was the chairman of the council. He said, no, I can't, I can't, I can't handle this. So he went to Jembe, who was the governor. I can't somebody name a street after Nzogu. What was wrong with Nzogu? Exactly. So Did I you ask her? Had my way. I, 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 I put the name there. It was there. Chukuman Zegu Crescent. You left it there? Yes. It's still there? Yes, Chukuman Zegu Crescent. You like him? Of course. I went to Okwanami in 1970 to meet his mother. He killed Amadu Bello. Why should you like him? Oh, come on. The man staged a, a beautiful coup. Beautiful? Yeah. It doesn't Can matter. a coup be beautiful? Of course. That would, they, 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 I mean, they do, they do, they do regime, regime change all over the world. They do regime change all over the world. But that coup led to a devastation, the civil war. It was not well handled. If Zegu had been lucky to be the, the president or the head of state, it would go the other way. It would go be the other way. We would have massacred the leaders. No! Left. 
Well, the role is massacred leaders. Uh, Manjis to El Mariam in Ethiopia massacred leaders. But never say. solved the problem of Ethiopia and Ghana, did it? Ghana is a better place than it was before Rollins. Certainly, yes. Certainly, yes. Certainly, yes. Ghana is... No, no, no government official in Ghana would dare steal the way they are still in Nigeria now. No blood. They won't dare. They will not dare. State Affairs with Edmondo Bilo is live. Yes, that is Chief Tola Dini. You know, this program is like a reflection with Tola Dini. As I look at the subject, Tola Dini will be coming in as a backup with his analysis. Tola Dini is Baba, he should be 78 now. Wow. Tola Dini has grown old. That vibrant journalist. Have you read his book? I'll tell you about that. Military officers mostly of Igbo extraction were killed apparently to reserve the malice of the first coup. So the coups came with vengeance, hate, ethnicity, religion, and corruption. Building Nigeria on these doctrines as the military did was the danger that took the country through the roads of underdevelopment and discontent. When Kaduna and Zogu and his collaborators struck in 1966, the Nigerian state was jolted to the belief that a new dawn has come with radical changes meant for the goodness of the people. This was not to be as the coup was hijacked by the head of the army, Aguyi Ironsi, who was killed in the July 1966 counter coup, apparently for not dealing decisively with the coup plotters that aborted the First Republic and for turning the country into a unitary state from his previous federal arrangement. Yakubu Gowon became military head of state after the killing of Ironsi. He was installed by the northern officers who avenged the January coup. His emergence distorted the question of seniority in the army. After Ironsi's death, the like of Lieutenant Colonel Dumego Ojuku expected Brigadier Baba Femi Ogundikbe, a Yoruba man and the most senior officer to take over. But northern officers behind the coup would not think that as they felt safer with a head of state from the north. With Ogundikbe out of the picture, it became a Herculean task to convince Ojuku, then military governor of the eastern region, to accept the leadership of Yakubu Gowon. The disagreement that ensued formed the basis of the Nigerian Civil War. It is important to note that Britain handed over the command of the Nigerian army to indigenous soldiers in 1965. The outgoing General Officer Commanding, GOC, Major General Welby Everard, had preferred, Babang had preferred Brigadier Ogundikwe to take over from him. But his recommendation was rejected, leading to Aguyi Ironsi, the most senior officer, taking charge of the army. When another opportunity came for Ogundikwe, he was overlooked again because it was felt he will not be able to control soldiers from the north who were only ready to take orders from a northern head of state. Having laid this background, we will come to 1983. But in understanding where we are coming from before 1983, I went to speak with Major Razaki Salao. 
Mijorazaki Salao fought in the Civil War. He was part of the 3rd Marine Commando that was led by Colonel Benjamin Adekunle. I wanted Mijorazaki to tell me about Ujuku and the coup. Understanding this background will give us a better reflection on what happened in 1983. Mijorazaki Salau on State Affairs. Own Nigerian regiment. That was the army used to be. Mm. And the Queen's own Nigerian regiment, which means we are still part of a, a British a, a army. Yeah. Or under the British colony. colonial army. The that colonial, you it's this colonial army. In fact, I joined NMF, Nigerian Military Force. Nigerian Military Force. They didn't call it Nigerian Army at that time. Mm. They didn't call it Royal Nigerian Army. They call it Nigerian Military Force. And that is what behind my number up to today. NMF, Nigerian Military Force. So it was Colonial Army. And you, you, you trained with Ujuku when you joined? In, in Zaria, the same day we were trained at Mobolaji Johnson. Zaria. When we, you see, Ojuku and Mobolaji Johnson were recruited. Lagos were part of Western Region at that time. So we have the same recruitment exercise. They recruited them from Lagos. They recruited us from Ibadan. In fact, they put us, the train that was coming, bringing Ojuku and Mobolaji Johnson from Ibadan, stopped at Dugbe here. This is the same Dugbe mm. here. In 1957, September 21, precisely. September 21, precisely. And they carry those of us who were recruited from Ibadan. And at this time, we have people from Midwest. They don't call them Midwest at that time. No thing like Delta. It was Western region. So it was that time we met Ojuku inside the, inside the train, first class. The rest of us were the second, whether they call it economic placards or so. We met him there. So he was actually playing with us that what do we want to go and do in the army and so on and so forth. We were joking. Myself and Mobolaji become tight friends because we were good athletics. Oh. We were good athletes. And we play, you know, seriously when we were in Zaria. In fact, that's what made me to become member of the Jogarubas basketball team. So what did you have see in Ojuku in 1957 during the training? You see, uh, the, the training actually was not completely... Uh, part of our own type of training. His own training was short-lived. Why? Because he was trained basically as somebody who will become an officer. So his own training had carried more advanced lecture, advanced lesson, preparing him to go to UK. He was already a graduate at that he time. He was already a graduate. He was already a, a, a product of Oxford University. We are some of us who are actually playing with uh, school art, modern three, and the rest of that. So, our own training was more rigorous than his own. It was followed with Oyibos, white men, more than our own. Mm. Our own, we have white men with us, but Africans, African instructors were more on our own side. And the, the, the brutality of the training on our own side was more serious than that of his own. So, the respect that was going to become an officer actually was adorn him mm. at that time. But then, he never left us behind. He's always around us after the training. Say, Rasaki, how are you? And so on and so forth. We will go and go do the games together. And was so he playful? Like. Was he jovial? He, was he stubborn? Ojuku, Ojuku was, uh, was, a, was a nice man to us. He was, he was very nice. But what you see in Ojuku is that he's highly reserved. Highly reserved. What do you mean by being highly What I mean reserved? by highly reserved is that when we are joking, talking about our families, uh, an Igbo man will be talking about Harujuku, I'll be talking about Ibadna, Ikiri, and so on and so forth. Somebody from um, Edo will be talking about Tauchi, Ura. Yes. You know, you know when, when you speak to persons who had relationship with those who have made history, you know, there's this feeling you get. You know, so when I went to meet Mijorazaki Salau, I had a three hours interview with him. I'm yet to broadcast that interview. I had that interview about three years ago. You know, what happened in the war front? That is why this class is out to serve you. To give you the best of history, the best of time. I'm ready to hear your voice. We have one number that you can call. One number that you can call. And the number 
is on the screen. That is 080-999-18449. We can only take WhatsApp calls. WhatsApp calls only. So 080-999-18449. I want this class to be interactive. As I move into the Buhari Babangida era, that is 080-399-18449. You can also leave your comment. That will help. So I'll be ready to pick your call when you're ready to speak to me. It's a dialogue into the future. Mijorazaki Salau there. Someday you will listen to the Salau interview. The names that executed the counter coup, I mentioned some of them in the last edition of the program. You can listen to that edition to abreast yourself of the issues of the past. Now let's move, let's move, let's come. Let's see. You remember last week I told you that after the counter coup, the northern officers that carry out the, that carried out the coup wanted to break away from Nigeria. So in proving the urgency of their demand, they hijacked a British VC-10 plane bound for London. The plane flew the families of the mutineers to Kanu from Lagos in preparation for a declaration of independence from Nigeria. The mutineers gave northerners in Lagos 40 hours to leave Lagos and return to the north. And I made the point that how the table turned that the same northern officers fought to Juku tirelessly to keep Nigeria one. That is the tragedy of the Nigerian adventure. Mortala Muhammad, the leader of the hardliners and his co-travelers that carried out the counter-coup, were convinced not to take the part of division. So they would later rally around Gowon to consolidate their leadership, having seen the need to remain in the entity called Nigeria. So this was welcomed and celebrated in the North. This was the same feeling that greeted the ascendancy to power of Mortala Muhammad in 1975. You know, Mortala Muhammad, after Gowon came in in 1966, Mortala Muhammad led the coup, but Gowan benefited from the coup. So by 1975, Gowan must have spent about nine years then as military leader. The same Mortala Muhammad ganged up with some other officers and overthrew Gowan. Gowan was in OAU meeting at that time. You know, I remember in that meeting, somebody walked up to go on to announce to him that, hey, something is happening at home. Sir, I think you have been overthrown. So he had to leave the meeting. Because at that point, he was no longer the leader of Nigeria. He has been overthrown. So he had to leave that meeting. He didn't come back to Nigeria. He went straight to the UK. I think he was in exile for some time. So Mortala Muhammad came to power. In 1975, and the North celebrated. To be precise, Gowan was overthrown on the 29th of July 1975. Nine years. You know, the counter coup was 29th July 1966. So on 29th July 1975, exactly nine years. After the counter coup, Gowon was removed by the same officers that put him there. So Motala came to power riding on the back of the disenchantment of Nigerians against Gowon's regime, a government that lost the trust of the people 
for dilly dallying with the transition to democracy program. You know, Gowan kept push, pushing the goalpost. I will hand over to a democratic leader tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, he said, no, let's, let's do it next tomorrow. So his colleagues in the military got fed up and they kicked him out in a bloodless coup. It was a bloodless coup. Nobody was killed. The Mortala of Basunjo regime, or Basunjo was Mortala's number two. He was chief of staff, supreme headquarters. So he was the number two to Mortala Muhammad. The Mortala of Basunjo regime at its inception demonstrated transformative leadership, both in domestic and foreign affairs. The government indicated early that the centerpiece of Nigeria's foreign relations was Africa. So I remember in December 1975, United States Secretary of State Henry Kinsinger called on Nigeria to rally other African countries to stop the takeover of Angola by the MPLA and support the United States favored UNITA. Mortalas Nigeria's head of state on the 6th of January, 1976, replied, saying, Africa has come of age and should no longer be dictated to. Let me read Mortala Muhammad's words. He says, Africa is no longer under the orbit of any extracontinental power. It should no longer take orders from any country, however powerful. He continues, The fortunes of Africa are ours to make, or ma. For too long have we been kicked around. For too long have we been treated like adolescents who cannot discern their interest and act accordingly. That was Mortala Muhammad replying to the United States. Mortala reminded the United States that the presumption that the African cannot make his or her choices without being teleguided by a foreign power holds no water. He said Africans are capable of resolving African problems. He asserts that the presumptuous lessons in ideological dangers from the West have no relevance for the problems of the time in Africa. Yes, that is the face of Mortala Muhammad. That is the picture of Mortala Muhammad. Mortala Muhammad was killed on Friday, 13th February, 1976, in an abortive coup led by Colonel Buka Suka Dimka. That coup. You see why books are powerful? Obasanjo is an intellectual. Give it to him. <laughs> you might not like him. You might like him. Because I've been reading Obasanjo's book. You look at this book, Not My Wheel, by Olusegun Obasanjo. This book. Obasanjo tells the story of what happened during Mortala's time. How Mortala was killed. This book is a classic on the military in Nigeria. I recommend this book to you. You can get it on udarabooks.com. I'm going to read from this book. But before I read from this book, Not My Will, by Olusegun Obasanjo, get this book, put it in your library. Give it to your children to read. Buy it for your sons and daughters, for your younger brother and sisters, for yourself. It is Nigerian history. Remember, I'm talking about the military, but the focus is how Buhari overthrew Shagari. But in my usual way, I will lay the background before I move into the subject so that we connect the dots, right? So this is the book you should go for, Not My Will, by Obasanjo. Before I read from the book, who is Mortala Muhammad? 
Some said he was brutal. That during the civil war, he wanted the Igbos to be decimated. He was all out. Some said he was reckless with power. Some said he had good intentions. He wanted to redefine Nigeria. The reason he removed Gowon. You know, Jumoke Ogunkeyede is an activist. He spent time with Pa Antonia Nahuru. He wrote a good book that I will be reviewing soon. In this interview, Jumoke Ogunkeyede talks about Mortala Muhammad. I had this interview with him in 2020. How time flies, about four years ago. So let's listen. And after that, I will read from Obasanjo's book. In your book, you said Enahuru believed that if Mortala Muhammad had spent more than six months in office as head of state, his reign would have been a study in misrule. Definitely. The same Mortala Muhammad? The same Mortala Muhammad. Uh, because the uh, example is when uh, Chivenaro uh, was sent as head of delegation to London to source funding for the Biafran war. And uh, when they were in the presence of the Prime Minister, I think Harold Wilson, uh, he said, Britain will not support the war in Nigeria as is. And they asked him why. He said, because your generals are killing children the war front. Chief Venaro said, he asked him, do you have any proof? He said, Dara Wilson opened his drawer, brought out some pictures. The, the head of uh, Muitala Mohammed and his cohorts put guns to the head of 12, 13 year old boys, killing them. But he was known to be ruthless though. Yes. Especially during the second coup, the Definitely. counter coup. Yes. And that's why the man said, we will not give you money until you tell your generals in the war front to stop killing children. And when Enahoro came back to when Nigeria and reported came, to the military council? Yeah, yeah Chief Enahoro saw Joseph Akinwale way as his mentor, his godfather, his big brother. Uh, gave him a not unofficial report of the joy of the trip and wondered uh, how he should present it at the, the Supreme Military Council. And Joseph Akinwale way, who was the head of the Navy then, just told uh, Chivenaro, why don't you discuss with your leader first? That leader was Chivaolawo. And he said he discussed with Awolawo, and Chivaolo said, present it as is. During the next military country, when you have to make your report about your trip to Britain. On presenting it, he had to now back it up with the pictures. Gawa was the head of state. Muritala Mohammed was part of the Supreme Military Council at a point in time. Murita Lamuamek stood up and started banging on the table. Who are you talking about, you bloody civilian? At that time, he talked with a harsh and strong voice. Gowon could not control him. Gowon admitted that he was the most difficult to control. Because they brought him to power. Because they, yes, they brought him to power. Gowon wasn't part of the coup. No. Gawan it was, was Murita Mohammed and coup. Yeah, it was because they didn't know who should take over amongst the core northerners. That they said, let's use... Uh, this uh, gentleman, this young man. And he could not control them. He could not. So and they, they finally had... booted him out in 1975. They did. They had to bring Gawan in from, who was at that time almost approaching Ghana, to oh, head the, the Nigerian system. And so when he said that, I will now how to uh, whisper to Gawan, please control your man. But Gawan could not. At that time, Awolo stood up and walked out of that meeting. Followed by his uh, uh, group, Enaro and the rest of them followed suit. And so Gawan went and appealed to Aula to come back and said, No, we will not come back unless you are able to tame the, this your shrewd. You must tame him. And he confessed to Aula, it's difficult to, 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 to tame him. Then he said, Then talk to whoever can tame him. I will not come back. So Gawan had to talk to the emirs. Who like, were, were like demigods at that time, and they told him to pipe low. And that was, they moved him out of uh, uh, Lagos 
And so God was able to come and go back to what he was doing. And he dealt with Enauru in his own way. When he became head of state, he seized Enauru's house. He was he went to our Enauru's house and took away the, 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 the <laughs> generators and things like that. I said to spite him. And uh, if not for the MS, he probably would have uh, uh, had uh, Chief Enauru killed or kidnapped or jailed or something. State Affairs with Edmondo Bilo is live. That is Jumoke Ogunkedi talking about Mortala Muhammad. Remember, you can join the discourse by calling 080-999-18449. You can call on WhatsApp if you want to add your voice to the discourse. Let me read from Obasunjo's book, Not My Wheel. Let me read from page 35. He says, in January 1976, I received a letter of warning from a friend in London. It turned out that he was merely repeating the rumors that they were then circulating and his letter contained no substantial proof of a coup plot against our government. The rumors were, however, now getting persistent and consistent enough to be taken seriously. In a partially humorous mood, I intimated Mortala with what I called harassment by my ADC and friends. In a characteristic response, Mortala said he hold, Mortala said he had told his ADC, relations and friends, to mind their own business and not to hinder the performance of his duties. He then went on to say that if anybody was dissatisfied with us and wanted to carry out a coup, it was up to him and his guard. You see, Motala Mohammed neglected the rumors of coup. Obasan Joyce narrating his encounter with Motala Mohammed. According to Obasan Joyce, Motala continues, if such a person did not succeed in killing all of us, our program will continue. However, if we were all eliminated, good luck to him in running the affairs of Nigeria. A passenger writes that Mortala rightly considered himself as being on a mission for Nigeria, and it was this attitude which charged the entire period of his administration. Such principled and uncompromising approach to duty remained with us throughout. Let's turn to page page 39. Basson just said in his book that behind Mortala's stern or stare and hard look lay a compassionate listener and humane disposition. I will exemplify this with two incidents during the early life of our administration. I was normally responsible for appointment into the boards of parastators with final approval from Mortala before seeking council approval why he took an appointment of civil servants and heads of parastators which were fully discussed with me before they were finalized. You see, if you read this book, Obasan just tells us the story of how they were worried about Mortala's security arrangement. There were times he would want to drive himself. That moving from his house to Dodan Barak, that he had just one escort vehicle, that they told him, no, 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 you have to beef up your security as head of state. Nigeria is changing. He did not listen until that morning when Bukasuka Dimka, Kone Bukasuka Dimka, 
opened fire on his vehicle and took him out. And that was the end of Mortala Muhammad. I urge you to get a copy of this book on udarabooks.com. A lot of revelations here. You will love this book, my, Not My Will, by Obasanjo. The program is state affairs. We are talking about the military in power. 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 Who loves power? I have talked about the first period of military rule that was from 1966 to 1979 because after the death of Mortala Muhammad, Obasanjo, his deputy, took over as the next senior military man. That was what Ojuku respected when Ironsi was killed, that the next person to take over was supposed to be Baba Femi Ogundikbe. When Mortala was killed, his deputy, Obasanjo, took over. So, after a break of four years, because the military handed over, Obasanjo handed over to a democratically elected leader, Shehu Shagari, in 1979. That was when Obasanjo handed over to Shehu Shagari. So, after a break of four years of civilian intervention, Shagari governed from 1979 to 1983, he ran for re-election. He won. The election was severely flawed. It was rigged. But he won. So he was sworn in for second term. But on the 31st of December, 1983, after Shagari has spent about August, September, October, November, about four months in his second term, the military struck. The military struck on the 31st of December, 1983. They came back again. You know, power can be sweet. It's intoxicating. If you allow men, they will govern forever. That is why you see some African leaders, after their tenure ends, they don't want to go. Go to where now? So you now go back and become a normal human being? It's never easy. But that's why democracy is beautiful. You know, just imagine all the powers behind Buhari. Those powers are gone. He's now a normal man. Yes, he still has some military officers around him as a former head of state. But not like, it's, it's Tinubu that is enjoying it now. That's power. What looked like a democracy was a project crafted by the military to recreate itself. That is why they came back in 1983. In Obasanjo, Buhari, Theophilus Danjuma, and David Mark, it shows its making. Even in the doors of Olabo de George and Jonah Jang, it defines its new image. The struggle for power at the center is also an affair of the military. Those centers of power controlled and manned by new pretenders to democracy now as is. You can see, if you want to win presidential election, you run to Obasanjo's house. You run to Bobangida's house. You run to Abdul Salami. They represent the institution of the military. Also of note is the military monarchy. Some of the MIs in the north are retired military officers. I hope you know. The Sultan of Sokoto, Mohammed Saad Abubakar, was a senior military officer. Huh? Haven't said that. Let's come close to the very young officers that defined Nigeria with their character. The group of young army officers that carried out the revenge coup of July 1966. Can you see the link? 
those young military officers that were used to carry out the counter coup of 1966 were the same boys that toppled the government of Yakubu Gowon that they installed in 1966. These same officers handed over to civilians in 1979 and they returned again on the 31st of December, 1983. They are still around. Muhammadu Buhari is one of them. In 2020, Rufai Hosseini, now of Arise, was on my show on Inspiration FM. Rufai wasn't with Inspiration then. So both of us were working for Inspiration. So I invited him and said, Rufai, come, let's talk about the military. And that was when Rufai wrote the book, Veritas, The Tale of a Sleeping Giant. So we were reviewing his book. And we then talked about the same military clique. Let's listen to that chart with Rufai, with Rufai Hosseini. Let's concentrate on the introduction of yeah. your book. Yeah. Part of the intro reads, The 1966 Kedah created successive dynastic military regimes for the next 32 years. Yes. The young non-commissioned officers and Lieutenant, who blasted Major General Aguyi Ronsi from power in 1966, were the same colonels who ousted his successor, General Goon, in 1975. Yes. And they became the brigadiers and major generals who overthrew President Shagari in 1983. Yeah. These officers included Ibrahim Babangida, Sunny Abacha, Muhammad Buhari, Shehu Musa Yadwa, Aliyu Muhammad, and Ibrahim Bako. Yeah. You were saying clearly that the leadership string of the Nigerian state has been stable from 1966. Down to this time. And it's not changed. That's what is prevalent. From the same crop, that same sweet spot. At the beginning, Ojuku fought against the emergence of this system. Does that not make him a positive rebel? When you, when you talk about being rebellious, and when you talk about Ojuku fighting for this system, there are many conversations up in the air about it. At first, some other people will even say he was part of this system. Some other people will say he was fighting against this system because he looked and said the people that were in this system were not in consonance with what he thought about. And that's why I say, you see, history takes various sides. I think it was somebody that said uh, prominently, it's only the victors that write history. It takes various angles to it. He fought against this. It led to the civil war. For me, what was very painful was the people that lost their lives in this war. Over two million of them, they lost their lives in this war. But there are many sides to history. Now let's leave the sides to this history and come again to your book. Yeah. Your new book is a call to action. Definitely. Over the years, a particular clique has held on to power. Yeah. They emerge and re-emerge. Definitely. The clique emerged in 1975. Yeah. Obasanjo emerged in 1976. Yes. Yeah. Became prominent. Yeah. Re-emerged in 1999. Yeah. Buhari emerged in 1984. Same, same that click. Re-emerged in 2015. Same that click. What is it about this click? This click has been able to understand the dynamics and the workings of power in this country. And you know, what they keep doing is that they have extensions. If you remember the Greek mythology, the cornucopia. So they have various heads to them. And what they've been able to do is to be able to pop up and take the reins of power. So they've pretty much been the order of the day. They understand the rudiments. What is the rudiments of power? Number one, wealth. This clique amassed a lot of wealth for themselves. Two, goodwill. Number three, fiat and power. So they understand the reins of power and they've constantly used this at their beck and call. State Affairs with Edmondo Bilo is live.
Yes, 2020. Was it 2020? No, no, that interview will fly. No, it wasn't 20. 2020 was coronavirus here. I think that was 2018. So have you read Rufai Hussein's book, Veritas, The Tale of a Sleeping Giant? That was the book we are reviewing there on Inspiration FM. When State Affairs was running on Inspiration FM every Sunday. You can get that book on udarabooks.com. Veritas, The Tale of a Sleeping Giant. We still have some copies. So you can contact us through our numbers. Our numbers are pinned to this broadcast. Or you go on the bookstore. There are books that come. You see? The same man. You need to read about Nzogu. Obasanjo again. When I say he's an intellectual, I know what I'm talking about. I have read his works. I think if you take uh, Obafemi Awolo and Aziki way out, I think Obasanjo is the most brilliant leader we've had. In, I mean, in terms of in, in intellectual acumen. But we don't see that most of the time. <laughs> you know? But I've read his work. If you take out Azikiwe and Obafemi Awolo, you know, Basanjo has written about 20 books. I know what it means to write a book. You know? Though Baba can be a rascal. You know, unlike Awolo that is calm, very philosophical. That's why I always say you need to read Travels of Democracy by Bafemi Awolo to understand that Baba was a deep philosopher. But Basanjo is distracted by power. So sometimes we don't see his intellectual power. You tend to see his bravado. But if you sat down and read him, you will see his intellectual power. I recommend Obasan just book Nzogu. And he seems to be the only one who has written a classic on Nzogu. Nzogu was his roommate. So read this book, Nzogu, by Obasan You'll get it on udarabooks.com. This book is out of print. This one is out of print. You can see how old it is. Luckily, I went to the publisher. I said, can you just go and check your warehouse? Please do go. Go and sweep it. You should be able to find at least 10 copies for me. And they did, and they got me some copies. The Military Leadership in Nigeria, 1966 to 1979, written by Major General James Oluleye. Good book. Good book. It's archival copy. You should have this book. It's archival. It is scarce. But well printed. Don't just listen to the class. Do your research. Read. Read. If you are preparing for leadership, if you have history behind you, you'll be a, you'll be a great leader. So this is another book I recommend to you. Military Leadership in Nigeria, 1966 to 1979. Contact us on WhatsApp. We've not put this on Udara Bookstore. But you get it. We have it. If you contact us on WhatsApp, you get your copies. I think we have about seven copies. They were able to get us seven copies. So we have put five copies on sale. Two copies are in Udara Books archives. They are not for sale. That's for posterity. So that tomorrow somebody can come and say, can you give us this book for research? We'll give it to you and you return it. That's why we'll keep at least two copies in our archives. So get this work. Willie Law is watching. Thank you. Okoro Donchuks Izundu. Donchuks, you can call in. Don't call the number you usually call. Call 08034918449. That's the number with me here. That's you can't reach me on the other. So call 08034918449. I want to hear from you. Donchuks. I know you like making your contribution to these issues. Uluremi Ugunjide, thank you for joining the broadcast. If I find your confidence, hello. You say I need the book. Say how much? Go on the page. We've told you where to get it. Okay? Just go on udarabooks.com. The prices are listed there. You don't need anybody to tell you how much. 
You can just go there. You don't need anybody. Just go on the store, make your purchase, and you get your book. Your book will be posted to you. You don't need anybody. You don't need to even call anybody. Your books will get to you. The store will call you. So, okay, your books is on the way. Sometimes the store will not call you. Just see your books. So, just go on the store or you contact us on Udara Books. Then you can ask the questions on WhatsApp, the questions you want to ask. Tony Frank Achonye is watching. Shukbong says, I'm reading Wally Shuinka's book, You Must Set Forth at Dawn, at the moment. A good book with a lot of revelations about what transpired behind the scenes regarding Niger's politics. Thank you, Shukbo. I recommended that book in the last class. You must set forth at dawn. That's showing Kaya's autobiography. Let's see who is on YouTube. Let's go on YouTube. YouTube X. Okay, X. I can see the X guys. X. X guys, no comment here. If you are on X, I will appreciate if you retweeted this broadcast if you're on facebook please share you know as you retweet or as you x the broadcast you attract more listeners to the class and we need that broad-based listenership we need it so by doing by retweeting reposting or quoting you are helping to expand the frontiers of the program so please repost quote share are you on linkedin you can also do same on youtube so please leave your comment all right there's a caller here hello hello can you hear me I have picked this call, but I cannot hear him. Hello? I can hear you. I can hear you. But it's not coming out Hello? there. It's not coming out from the system. Oh, no, but I can... Yes, I can hear you now. You have turned off my mic. Hello? Okay, you can make your contribution. Hello? I can hear you. Make your contribution. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Steve calling from Scotland. Okay. Um, I didn't know I'll get you, so it's, it's a very beautiful surprise. Um, let me go straight to the point about Obasanjo being um, a deep thinker. And, um, you know, a, a philosopher, written him with the likes of Awo and um, the great Zik. I slightly tend to disagree. Um, remember, he was in Zogo's roommate, like everyone knows, and they were very close. And I strongly feel if he was a, if he was a, on a certain kind of wavelength, he clearly would have been part of you know the group that did that coup, which of course he was not. So, to me personally, um, I think. That indicates he was a loud mouth, um, you know, and he wasn't really the the the, 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 the he, he didn't have the the stuff that these other guys, you know, the quality of stuff they were made of, you know. And um, yes, to me, that's my own contribution. And I've read some of these books you've talked about in Zogo, um and the rest, the ones the the five majors, or is it the six majors? You know, and a couple of other books, you know, back in the days. And um, I also recommend people read them. I mean, in my early 50s, um, I think if you read these books, it kind of gives you a very well-rounded idea of what Nigeria is and not just getting your stories from one source. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I like that contribution. Thank you. Yes, let's hear from you. But the point I made is that I'm not comparing Obasanjo to Obafemi Awolo. I said, if you take Obafemi Awolo and Zeke out and then compare Obasanjo to other leaders that have governed Nigeria, that is the most intellectually endowed. That's the point I made. 
Okay? Awolowo was in a class of his own. You could see if you read Awolowo's books, you, you know what I'm talking about. He was a deep philosopher. I didn't even call about Sanjay a philosopher. I was called I saw it, Awu. Then Zeke. And again, that you are a loud mouth does not mean you are not an intellectual. We have different nature. Some people can be calm. You have some intellectuals, brilliant men that are loud mouth. They will talk. And they perhaps Nzogu and Kuwe are not confident, uh, did not trust him. That doesn't mean he's not an intellectual and brilliant. They, they don't just trust him. And so they didn't want to involve him in the coup. As simple as that. That they didn't involve him does not mean that they were more brilliant than him. Let's get that point clear. They were other brilliant military officers. The Nzogu guys were revolutionary. It doesn't mean they were the most brilliant in that military. Like Baba Femi Ogunde, Gowan is a brilliant man. You know something? What you, people who know how to survive the system. Nzogu did not survive the war. He was killed six months into the war. So some people would say he was not smart. Why did he just die like that? You know, and some people say he was unnecessarily temperamental. And when you are that temperamental, you cannot be a good leader. You know, some people, Zogu might not, might not have been a good leader. You could, you, see, you could even see the interviews he granted after the coup, the way he was talking. You could see youthful exuberance. He could have been too brutal. So, let's get it right. Sometimes, some calm persons might be more intelligent than those who are brutal. And some can be brutal and intelligent. But those who learn to survive, what about you have learned to survive? And how? There must be something about him. He understands the game of power. That's also brilliant. He might be negative. <laughs> Tinubu has played his way to power. <laughs> That's a form of brilliant. He waited. He beat there this time. He knew how to rise. He knew the system. They captured it. And he got to power. Whether you like it or not, that's a form of brilliance. He got what he wanted. He's the president. And you, you have PhD. You've been wanting to be president. You are nowhere. So sometimes, it depends from the angle you are looking at it from. Brilliance takes different form. That is why you can also see a gangster in the Niger Delta. You might think you have PhD. That you are more brilliant. No, no. Some people have what you call local intelligence. And they know how to manipulate their system. If you go to a place like Ogunpa here, you might see some illiterate. They didn't go to, they didn't go to schools, but they are rich. They are millionaires in Ogunpa. They do big businesses. They understand businesses. And they are richer. They have employed graduates. That is brilliant. It takes different forms. That's the point I'm making. Because sometimes those who have gone through the four worlds of university tend to have this superior uh, ego thinking, oh, since we have gone to university, we are the most brilliant. It doesn't necessarily work that way. Brilliance can be local. All right, let's come, let's come. I'm ready to take your call. I'm ready to also engage your thoughts. And you can also engage my thoughts. I'm also here to learn. I learn from you. I'm ready to learn. I'm open to learning. That's why every day I feel I don't know anything. That's why I keep researching. And the more I know, the more I discover I don't know enough. But as I pick up a new material, I'm saying, wow, wow. You know, I almost did not come for this show. I almost told my guys, hey, let me announce I'm not coming for this show. Because as I was researching for the program, I was discovering more information. And I was writing, writing. I'm saying, no, let me take my time to finish this script. I don't have enough time. I said, no, you will finish it. You have written more than enough. It just, I wasn't satisfied. But I discovered, as I'm talking to you now, I have about 32 pages. I'm skipping. I'm skipping some so that I, I ran off this program at four. That is what knowledge does. You keep researching and you keep learning. You know, at a point, I said I won't read Obasanjo. There was a time I said, I'm not going to read Obasanjo. I was angry with him. I said, okay, if you want to be an intellectual, you must read even those you like and those you don't. I don't I'm not saying I hate him, no. There are some aspects of him I like. And there are some aspects I don't like. And certain persons will also like some aspects of me. Okay? Oh, he's calling again. Hello. Hello. 
on it, Stephen, once again. Yes. Can I just make one quick contribution and I'll allow others? Please go ahead. I appreciate what you said about um, not, you know, if uh, the, the issue about you being a loud mouth, but not also being an intellectual at the same time, which is correct. I, I am with you on that. You could be, you could be very loud, flashy, uh, you know, erratic, but you could still be a thick, a deep. In fact, a deep, a deep thinkers have most of these attributes. If you really go through the, you know, the the yardstick of, you know, deep thinkers, most of them are loud. Mm. You know, most of them, you, they need to voice out what, you know, that thinking that they are thinking. You know, having said that, you also said something about um or oh, basson joe surviving because he had lent the system and things like that now edmond this is where you and i might get it wrong learning that system means you know to me that's another word of you know being uh, compromising you know um doing things you shouldn't do uh, um not having principles you know and that's the nigerian standard as we speak Everyone that has stood up in that in that country that have got strong uh, principles, you know, uh, that they want to stand on, uh, you know how it always goes, you know. So to me, uh, most of these so-called survivors in power, they've sold their soul in one way, in one way or the other, you know. Uh, so at times, it's now a question of. Uh, um, you know, you deciding is it is what you want for yourself or what you want for for the people. And in most cases, if you choose, uh, you know, uh, what you want for your what what you want for the people, then trust me, you're stepping on many toes. And in such cases, that's where you get people kicked out of power, either by internal or external forces. Edmond, it's been a pleasure. And let me say this. Um, it might sound funny, I'm a man, so don't take it any other way. But you've got one of the best uh, um, voices on radio. One love, bro. Keep Thank on doing the good job. Thank you. One love. One love. Thank you. You see, you see engagement. You know, when, when you allow a program to be interactive, I'm enjoying the engagement. You know, he comes back, you know, to say, yes, you see, that is why we need discourses. It's not about, oh, I stand on this ground. You know, sometimes when you hear somebody say, no, I stand on this position and don't change. <laughs> they are not ready to learn. You know, when you meet superior arguments, as an intellectual, you should shift. I do that a lot. I shift. I shift my mindset consistently. I'm not rigid. Yes, I have certain principles. So he makes a point. And the point is vital. Obasanjo and co they now understand the system. So they've compromised the system. But we also need intellectuals to counter them. You know, we cannot allow them, we will counter them. With our principles. What is the basis of your principle when you allow men who compromise the system and impoverish the land? So you need intellectuals to counter them even when I miss some. It's about military in power. How Buhari and friends toppled the Shagari government. The actions of the military in government is the behavior of the present Nigerian state. Democracy has not succeeded in creating deep reforms as the primordial sentiment that set the country on a war path from 1967 to 1970 remains. The adoption of the rule of law is selective. In the Buhari or Shibajo era, the path of the presidency was challenged by the DSS when it imposed a blockade on the National Assembly. This was an affront on an acting president who acted swiftly to check the corruption of power. It reminds one of how Buhari, then a military officer, went beyond orders to invade Chad. Are you in this class? 
In 1983, Chadian rebels made indiscriminate incursions into Nigeria, threatening the territorial integrity of the state. Apparently miffed by the audacity, the Shagari government sent in the army to dislodge the Chadian militants. Muhammad Buhari commanded troops led the offensive against the Chadians. On dealing heavily with the rebels, Buhari's forces occupied parts of Chad against the orders of President Sheu Shagari, the commander-in-chief. It is said it took the interventions of senior officers like then Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Inuwa Wushishi, for Buhari to comply to the orders of the Commander-in-Chief, Shehu Shagari. Are you there? The Commander-in-Chief, the President, gave orders to Buhari as a military officer. He refused to comply. Was that not a sign to Shagari that something was going to happen to him? That these military officers were no longer in tandem with his ways? For a top CNC, that day would have been Buhari's last time in the military. I will fire you immediately. But Shagari didn't have the balls because these guys had him to ransom. He needed to appease them because these military boys had formed a clique let, let, let's go, let's go. You see power, the power game. You know, there's a power game unfolding in Tinubu's time. We'll talk about that. Let's give the president some time so that we also understand the power game that is going on. In every system, in every administration, there is this power game that is unique to it. Shehu Shagari. You see, this is Shagari's autobiography. Can you say it? Sadly, we don't have copies anymore. So this, this one is from the archives. We don't have copies and the book is out of print. And Heinema, Heinema published this work. Heinema is in trouble at the moment. So Heinema's office has been locked up in the last one or two years. I hope they come out of the court case successful. So that we can go back and say, give us this book. Shagari's autobiography, Beckoned to Serve. I'll tell you more about this book. It's not available on udarabooks.com. So Buhari's recalcitrant attitude to Shagari explains the powers the military boys weeded that they could defy a civilian president. Max Yolun in his book Soldiers of Fortune reveals that some senior officers compiled a list of ministers they wanted in Shagari's government. <laughs> yes, one of the best books on the military. Max Yolun. In this class, you must read. You must read in this class. Look at the book. Soldiers of Fortune, Nigerian Politics from Buhari to Babangida, 1983 to 1993. One of the books I read to write my script. I have talked about this story on three occasions. I think the last time I discussed this subject was in 2000, January 2000 or July 2021. Then on Inspiration FM in 2019, I also discussed it. So I've been improving on the script. Now the script has grown. So this script now can be a book. I can decide to publish a small book on this subject because I've been doing this research over time. And this is one of the books that have helped in my research. You need this book on your table. Get it on udarabooks.com. You know, we are collecting Books, all available books on Nigerian politics. So with time, in the next two years, you should be able to find every book. And we are, we are getting to the point where we are going to sign deals with the authors. It's okay. 
Now, this book is out of print. You don't want to print it again. Can you give us the rights to print it so that we can distribute it? And we'll give you some part of the money for your intellectual power for writing the book. Like Ojuku's book. We can't find that book because I was involved. It is out of print. But I'm already discussing it. Can we, can you give us the right? Let's reprint. But that will cost a lot of money. But we'll get there. We'll do it. We'll print it. And make sure you read it. You put it on your table. So we are moving into that era. Why Shagari was removed. So get the book Soldiers of Fortune. Then, you know, Buhari refused the orders of Shagari. So I'm asking, can the refusal of the IGP, Inspector General of Police, to take orders from Buhari when Buhari was civilian president, to stay in Benue, be seen in the same light? You know, the IGP, Buhari told the IGP to relocate to Benue. When bandits invaded Benue, the IGP did not go. Perhaps Buhari was not serious. He didn't even want him to go. So can it be said that what goes around comes around? Or is it also that Buhari does not have the capacity to be in charge? You know, at some point we were saying, are you sure Buhari is in charge? The way bandits were running amok, killing people. It hasn't stopped. So we are asking, is Tinubu in charge? So what then is the problem? Like the problems associated with Buhari's second coming, like the indescribable confusion the military foisted on Nigeria's politics. Buhari perhaps did not forgive Shagari for the manner he ordered him out of charge. There were other issues that aggravated the resentment Buhari had for Shagari. You know, just imagine as his chief of, commander-in-chief, and I know there's a military officer who does not lie, we take him out. That's why I'm in C, that's why I'm seeing C. I give you order, you don't take it? As the commander-in-chief? Tinubu is the commander-in-chief. He gives the chief of army staff order, he doesn't take it? You are leaving the next day. But again, it also depends on the power the military boys weed. So Shagari knew that if he made any attempt to discipline any of the officers, he would be in trouble. He knew. He knew he would be in trouble. So he was managing them. He didn't want to offend them. Because by this time, the military guys were well entrenched. They've been around. You know, they've, they've installed a government in 1966. They've removed that same government in 1975. They've governed. They've occupied positions. Theophilus Danjuba was one of them. Big boy. You know, they all got, many of them got oil wells. You know, they distributed oil wells among themselves. So they are some of the richest men in Nigeria at the moment. Don't be surprised, they are richer than Dangote, but they are not declaring their wealth. Yeah. These guys are stupendously rich. You have islands around the world. Oil money. So now it is about gold, lithium. So bandits are taking over communities to mine those minerals while the people suffer. They take over the communities, chase the people away, and they become displaced people. Big boys are behind them. Talking about Buhari and Shagari. Buhari was also said not to have been in good terms with Umaru Diko, Shagari's powerful minister of transport. You know, there's always a powerful man in every government. Under Shagari, the most powerful minister was Umaru Diko, from my research. There might be others we don't know. But Umaru Diko, the minister of transport, was the most powerful. Buhari didn't like him. When Buhari toppled Shew Shagari's government, Umaru Diko ran for his head and went to hibernate in London. Buhari wanted his head by all means. Buhari went for him. 
through the assistance of Israel's secret agent, Buhari almost succeeded in transporting Umaru Diku in a crate, like a goods. No, they packed him in a crate to bring him to Nigeria in a secret operation that was aborted by the British government. And it led to a fight between Nigeria and Britain. In returning to the Shagari event, one name comes to mind. He is Ibrahim Badamosi Babangida. You know, that guy doesn't write books. I want to read his book. Because if you quietly investigate in the military, you know, there's something special about Babangida. But he will not write a book like Obazunyo. General Babangida was key to the plot to remove Shagari. In accessing the situation that made the removal of Shagari easy, one must not forget that, like the Buhari that just left power, Shagari surrounded himself with his kinsmen, mostly from Sokoto State, his home state. You know, that's what Buhari did. Chief of Army Staff from the North, Chief of Defense Staff from the North, Head of Police from the North, Head of DSS from the North. That's what Shagari did. Umaru Shinkafi, the Director General of the National Security Organization, now DSS, was from Sokoto and he worked with Shagari. Under Shagari, the Commander Brigade of Guards, Muhad, Muhammad Belo Kalia was from Sokoto. You know, the Commander Brigade of Guards is in charge of the security of the president. If you go to Abuja now, there's a brigade of guard, an army company that is in charge of the protection of Tinubu. So if you want, if you want to deal with Tinubu, you have to first deal with that brigade of guards. They will take you out. It's made up of sharpshooters, top military guys, some of the most brilliant. They make up the brigade of guards. So the brigade of guard is key. The head of that brigade of guard is so key to the safety of the president. They are never popular, but they are there. So under Shagari, he made sure that the head of the brigade of guard was a man from his state, Sokoto state. That is Belo Kalia. The general officer commanding 2nd Mechanized Division, Major General Mohamed Jiga, was from Sokoto State, the same state as Shagari. Top military formations were occupied by northern officers under Shagari. Major General Muhammad Buhari was GOC, 3rd Armored Division. Major General Abdullahi Sheleng, Commandant Nigerian Defense Academy from the north. Major General Haladu Hanania, GOC 2nd Mechanized Division, was from the north. As mentioned earlier, the Chief of Army Staff was General Wushushi, from the north. Then Major Sambo Dasuki was a military assistant to Wushishi. You know Sambo Dasuki? He later became um, under Jonathan, the national security advisor. He was the one distributing the dollars that Buhari was investigating. You know, they've always been around. You know, so he was the guy Jonathan made national security advisor. Was distributing. And Buhari kept him in prison for a long time before Northern leaders begged for his release. You know, he was a smart intelligence officer. You know, you have military intelligence. The chief of defense staff, Lieutenant General Gibson Jallo, was from the north. Air Vice Marshal Abdullahi Dominic Bello, chief of air staff, was a northerner under Shagari. But Vice Admiral Akin Aduo, chief of naval staff, was from the south. 
Major General Ibrahim Babangida was director Army Staff Duty and Plan, while Brigadier Sani Abacha was Commandant 9th Mechanized Brigade. Brigadier Tunde Idiagbo was Army Secretary. I'm mentioning these names to refresh your mind of the repetition of history in Nigeria. Tinubu is better. He balanced it. Tinubu balanced it. You can give that to him. But he made sure that the chief of army staff is a Yoruba man. He needs to protect himself. So Lagbaja is from Yoruba. And for a very long time, when was the last time a Yoruba man was chief of army staff? Ah, did not have always occupied it. It was only Jonathan that had the guts to make an Igbo man chief of army staff. It was only Jonathan. Uh, what's his name again? Azubike Hijirika. That is the only Igbo man that have occupied that position since the Ironsi days. For what they were doing at some point, once an Igbo guy gets to Cornell, they retire him. Yes, it was that bad under Babangida Abacha. Once an Igbo man gets, they retire him or they push him to an administrative post. Because the fear of the Igbo man still lingers. You know, the way they carried out that first coup, it was brutal. So they, they are still scared of the Igbo man. That if you give these Igbo people the chance with their economic power, ha, they will dominate. Because they were dominating. That was one of the reasons Zeke preferred to go into alliance with Amadou Bello, so that the Igbo man could dominate the North. Because Northerners didn't go to school. So Igbo man could go... He wanted the woman to occupy the various positions, but he backfired. At the point that Amadou Bello came out and said, no way. Instead of us to have an Igbo man here, we'd rather go and import people from other African countries. You could see. But somehow, we have the capacity to redefine the Nigerian state. We must redefine it. And that is why we are in this journey, studying history and power. Remember, you can call. I want to hear from you. I'm not in a rush. If I don't finish the script, we'll continue another day. Somebody's saying, can you reserve a copy? Can you reserve a copy of the book, Military? Okay, yes, I will. All right, I will, Mr. Yomi. I will reserve a copy for you. All right, you can call. You can call. Let me hear from you. Don't just listen to me. I want to hear from you. I want to learn from you. We'll be ending this broadcast at four. Remember, from this studio, we broadcast every Monday, Wednesday and Fridays at 2 p.m. West African time. But tomorrow morning, I'll be broadcasting from Splash FM studio. That is 8 to 11 a.m. in the morning. And you, you still follow it on this page. On this page, so that is going on terrestrial radio, but we'll also be streaming on this page. Splash 105.5 FM, Ibadan. That is from 8 a.m. to 11 tomorrow. I'm happy you have joined this broadcast. So you can call 0803-0918-449. So the number is on the screen. Let's hear from you. Invite your friends to join the class, the class of history, politics, and power. I'm talking about military power. Shagari surrounded himself with northern military officers. Okay. You know what goes on here? We are not going to end this broadcast. You know, power, it's about power situation. But we are going on. We will turn on our power source. So that is why the picture went off. But stay with us. And we also have to solve the power, the problem of power in Nigeria. 
solving the problems of power in Nigeria. So I've talked about the names, and I mentioned the names. Shagari surrounded himself with those northern military officers. Buhari came and improved on it. So we did not learn from history. In fact, Shagari was more magnanimous because Sunday Adebayo Adeusi from Oyo State had the privilege to be the Inspector General of Police. The ethnic question is deep and it continues to hold down the progress of the Nigerian state. Jonathan was guilty too, but not as intensely as Buhari. Obasanjo came out better, yes. Obasanjo balanced it. Obasanjo was more Nigerian in his approach. Buhari was an ethnic jingoist. He was more comfortable with men from his tribe. Surrounding himself with northern officers did not stop the same officers from removing him from power. The subtle democracy of the time was dismantled through a military gang up. The collaborators include Muhammadu Buhari, Ibrahim Babangida, Ibrahim Bako, Halilu Akilu, and Sania Baja. Okay, we have a caller here. Hello. Hello, Mr. Edmund. Hello. Hello, Mr. Edmund. Good morning from here. All right, and good afternoon from here. I know you are calling from the United States. Yeah, yes, I'm calling from the United States. Good. I understand that the reason why um, the Northern soldiers um, overthrew um, um, Sheikh Shagari was because of um, the women. Because they, they knew that for them to allow him to finish his tenure, it would be obvious for a woman to be the one to take, to take over from him. That was why they overthrew him, from my own opinion. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, the Northerners, they don't want an Igbo man to take over. They were all afraid of uh, an Igbo man. That was the reason why they did all that. Okay. But don't you think they should have, they would have also waited at least, at least one year to the end of the term? Um, I, I don't know the reason why they were able to do it. They, they were in a hurry. Okay. Yeah, because they, they thought that maybe before, maybe if they say, okay, let us wait it when, they are, when the administration is over almost three years, they might retire all of them. You okay? Interesting, interesting yeah. perspective. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was why they struck. That was why they struck. I see. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. That's another perspective to the discourse. You can never know. But I've tried to also explain why Buhari didn't want Shagari and they wanted him out. So those who wanted Shagari out and plotted to remove him were Muhammad Buhari, Ibrahim Babangida, Ibrahim Bako, Halilu Akilu, and Sania Bacha. Joshua Dogo Yaro was one of them. Then the younger officers were Tunde Ogbeha, Lawan Gwandabe. Remember Gwandabe Abacha almost killed him. Mustafa Jokolo. Mustafa Jokolo later became the Emir of Gwandu. Yes. I think Abacha deposed him. Abubaka Uma was also part of the coupes that dethroned Shagari. 
So they are northern officers. That's the point. There were civilian collaborators too. Shagari, in his autobiography, I've shown you this autobiography. He said, Shew Shagari beckoned to serve. In this book, in this book, I read this book in preparation of the show. So Shagari, in this book, beckoned to serve, suggested that a wealthy Nigerian was part of the plot that toppled his government. That Nigerian must be MKO, Abiola, a friend of the military. Abiola was a friend of the military. And his friends also dealt with him. You know, some would say they made him too, that they, they gave him contracts that made him a billionaire. So, we have made you, and you want to also come and take political power. And you later begin to deal with us. Who, who you be? You see how they think? One day, should I discuss? You know, there's a subject I've been avoiding to discuss in the public domain. You know, how they really get power. The role they play. You know, there are different mafia organizations in Nigeria. There are different blocks. You know, should I discuss that public? I don't know. Someday we might consider that. Or Basanjo's role in the removal of Buhari of Shagari was prominent. Shagari in this book accused of Basanjo of, of involving in coup baiting through his vitriolic attacks. Chief Tola Adeni, my veteran journalist friend, you know, talks about Buhari. You know, these, these were journalists who had access to power. These were journalists who knew where the military men were relaxing. They could go there. You know, journalism during their time was quite different. You still have it in these days. Journalists who have access to power. Yes, I have access to power to some extent, especially in this domain. You know, where you could sit down, you get some gist that is not flying around. And you keep it to yourself. You just have to keep it to yourself. But you learn from it and somehow deploy it in your analysis. So Chief Tola Adini, former chairman of the Daily Times of Nigeria, talks about Shagari in this interview with me. I mean, even at that time, it was because I believe that Shagari was, was least qualified. I mean, if it had been a middle candidate that emerged as president, I wouldn't have minded. Even Waziri Ibrahim could have, we might, but not Shagari. Because I was with Shagari for a week in 1976 in November, before elections. You know, maybe. That is for three years to, to election. What did you see in the school teacher, Shagari? You were with him. What did you see? Well, I phoned that I was coming to, to see him. I, I went to see him, to see Inuawada, to see Aminokano, and to see Monguno, because I wanted to assess those who are likely to emerge as president of Nigeria. And earlier on in 1976, before November, I'd, in a gathering in, uh, in, 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 in Atlanta, Georgia, Shagari was introduced as Nigeria president. In 1976, around February, April, He was introduced? Yes, in the gathering. In a white man's gathering. Who did that? The white people sitting down there. They already saw it coming? I wouldn't know, but they said that is the future president of Nigeria. But in 76 November, they said, What did I see in him? So I went to see him. He came to the airport, came to the Sokoto airport, and asked me. He was driving a station wagon Peugeot. He was then a member of the Sokoto Education Board. And he offered me to sit at the back while he was on the, on the wheel. And I said, No, in my culture, I can't sit behind you while you. Uh, an elder person who will be sitting, will be driving me. So I sat with him, put my briefcase at the back. So went to his house, sat down, drank and ate and ate. We ate and so on. Then during the interview, he interview, told me all he wanted in his life was to become a senator. That was the highest he would love to have. And I said, sir, do you even think you are qualified to be a senator? I said, well, the Senate is not meant for the most brilliant or the most educated. The Senate is meant for the, the, the elderly people, the people that have... Uh, wisdom of elders. And that's what Senate is all about. Uh, according, according, I think he read some history about Rome. 
is that Roman senators were not particularly the most brilliant. Even had you had Cicero, you had uh, some other people in the Senate. And so I wanted to be in the Senate. And I left it at that after spending about three or four days with him in his village. If I went to see Munguno, and I went to see Kano, and I went to see Inua Wada. Were you impressed by him? By Shagari? Yeah. I was impressed by his humility, impressed by his candor, impressed by his tidiness. He was a very tidy person, very neat, very organized. What was it His that environment it, was clean. What was it that did impress you? He didn't have enough intellectual capacity or capability to rule over a country like Nigeria. How were you able to decide for that? Because I interviewed him, I saw him, I knew him. I, I, he had good diction, he spoke well, but he, he didn't have... There are questions I asked him that he couldn't answer. He didn't know, he didn't know who the author of Things Fell Apart was. So when he became president, you were sure that he was going to be a disaster? I wrote several stickers against him while he was aspiring to be president. During the campaign, I said, there was one I said in, in, in Jebu, uh, that is Shagari not here. That was the title. I said Shagari not here. In the Jebu language, it, it, it will be Shagari Eshibe. That is not here. You can't be here. You can't, it's not you. You call Shagari Shukuluku Bango How? How did he offend you, Chief Adeli? Huh? When I look back on those articles, I laugh. I mean, you don't, don't forget you that, that, was, that, that was, don't forget that that was satire. I mean, you know, I enjoyed my satirical writings. Because you read it, you will laugh at yourself, even though you know that I'm poking fun at you and I'm also... But what was your meaning of Shukuluku Bango She? Looking back and looking at his image, doesn't he look like Shukuluku Bango She? How does Shukuluku Bango She <laughs> look? Onomotopia. Just look at the word, the, the way the word sounds. That's all. That's why I use the word. The way it sounds, Onomotopia. Shukuluku Bango She. You know, look at him. Look at his structure. State Affairs with Edmondo Bilo is live. Chief Tola Adeni there. I have decided I will finish this script. So we might extend the broadcast to 15 minutes past four. Yes, I need just additional 15 minutes. So I don't have to come back with part two. So I can move on to other subjects I've worked on. And that will be on Monday by 2 p.m. Shokoloko Bango She. You know, that is journalists with their troubles. Like he's doing now against Buhari, a passenger has always been in the business of attacking sitting government. He has not started attacking Tinubu. He has never, he's not, he has not written Tinubu a letter. I'm waiting for Basanjo's letter. He will always write letters. Baba, when will you write Tinubu a letter? We are waiting for Baba's letter to Tinubu. He wrote Buhari stinkers. You know? Are you on X? Repost on X. We'll be happy to see you repost. Are you watching on Facebook? We'll be glad to have you share the broadcast. Thank you for your kindness. In a person just let a writing hobby is what is meant the repeat of history. Ask Babangida, Abacha, Jonathan, and Buhari. Hopefully, they will tell you about a person just let a writing prowess. Sadly, his letters always meet their objectives, but under Buhari, he did not meet it. In an interview he granted to Point Blank News, published on the 25th of January 2008, Babangida confessed that they had planned to hand power to Obasanjo when they consolidated the plot to remove Shagari, but Obasanjo declined. Are you following history? In that interview, in 2008, 2008, Babangida confessed that they had planned to hand power to Obasanjo when they consolidated the plot to remove Shagari, but Obasanjo declined. Anyway, he could not decline when the same click knocked on his door in 1999. Can you see how they roll? 
the role. You need to study power. And there are some books I'm not advertising. I'm not mentioning them. There are books on power. I just keep them. For those who are interested in power, I say, you, 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 you get this copy. Because there are books you are capable of misinterpreting if you are not deep enough. So I'm very careful to say, hey, I recommend this book to you. I keep it for the men of power, men who like power, men who want power, men who want to change society. I keep those books for them. Okay? Theophilus Danjuma, a retired army chief of staff, you know, when Obasanjo was military president, Theophilus Danjuma was the chief of army staff. It was Theophilus Danjuma that took out Iromsi in Ibadan. They were the guys. They were the same military officers that took out Iromsi. In fact, Theophilus Danjuma was stationed in Ibadan to carry out that coup against Iromsi. So he led the guys who arrested him in government house here, and they drove him to Lalukmon where they killed him. That's power. It's the game of power. You know. Yes. Theophilus Danjuma was chief of army staff. He was also briefed about the coup to remove Shagari, and it was Mustafa Jokolo who went to brief him. And that revelation was made in the Daily Sun of September 29, 2009. Do you still read newspapers? Please read newspapers. I got my power of analysis from reading newspapers. I bought my first newspaper in JSS2. I went to the stand to buy it. I remember that paper is the Tribune newspaper. So at that age, I was interested in politics. Why my friends were buying both? both. I'll be buying newspaper. I'll be reading the newspaper and marking them. My father will be looking at me and be smiling. I'll be marking. It got to the point my dad will be contributing money to me to go and buy newspaper. And you can see that is what I'm doing today, analysis. So from the power of the past. I would go then to Ring Road in Benin. In Jesus, I'll be looking for old books they sell on the street. I still have some of those books. I bought the autobiography of Richard Nixon on the street in Benin. And that was what opened me to global politics, that autobiography. I remember I was reading it in SS3. I said, wow. I've always loved politics. I love power. I would go for power at some point. What about you? All right. It's the class of politics and power coming to you from Ibadan. That is where we are streaming from. Ibadan is the land of power. So these names I've been mentioning are key as to who gets what in Nigeria. So does power really belong to the people in the true sense of the word in Nigeria? On 30th December 1983, leaders of the coup assembled in Lagos to launch the final plan. Buhari flew in from Joss for the meeting. It was the responsibility of Ogbeha to disarm the brigade of guards peacefully. Can you see? For you to overthrow Shagari, you must disarm the brigade of guards. That means somehow you must have a collaborator in that brigade of guards for you to access the president. Yes. Otherwise, there will be, it will be bloody. You guys will have to fight with bullets if you don't have an insider in the brigade of guard. So when you see these cool happenings in Burkina Faso, there is an insider in the brigade of guard that makes it easy. Or the head of the brigade of guard will even be the one to overthrow. But in this case... See, let's see. You see what happened. How they took out Shagari. They didn't kill him. It was, a, it was meant to be a bloodless coup. Just that, unfortunately, somebody had to pay the price. It was the responsibility of Ugbeha, Tunde Ugbeha, to disarm the Brigade of Guards peacefully. The Brigade of Guards is the army formation that protects the head of state. The commander was Colonel Kaler. He suspected a coup 
and ordered his men to protect the president at all costs. Brigadier Ibrahim Bako had the task to arrest Shagari at the presidential villa. But Ibrahim Bako would lose his life in the mix-up that followed his execution of his part of the coup. Gods, Bako walked into his death, unknowing that the presidential guards were on red alert. There are different sides of the story. This, however, did not stop the coup from succeeding. The deputy commander of the brigade of guards and his boys were part of the plot. That was the insider. So those insiders, those members of the brigade of guard, arrested their commander, Colonel Kaler. Are you getting the point? The deputy to the head of the brigade of guard arrested his boss, Colonel Kaler, for ease of operation. Shagari was not immediately arrested as his guards took him to safety. But he gave himself up, having been reassured of his life. The coup was executed on the 31st of December. 1983, on the eve of a new year. Shagari was placed under house arrest and his eldest son, Captain Mohammed Shagari, was retired from the army. His son was in the army. So Buhari and co retired him. The chief of defense staff, Lieutenant General Gibson Jalo, was retired immediately. Mohammed Wushishi, chief of army staff, Air Vice Marshal Abdullahi Bello, Chief of Air Staff, and Vice Admiral Akin Aduo, Chief of Naval Staff, were also told to leave the military. Sani Abacha made the first broadcast of the coup. Remember him, Abacha? You know, they will come, fellow Nigerians. So Abacha in his announcement said, I and my colleagues in the armed forces, having the discharge of our national role as promoters and protectors of our national interest, decided to effect a change in the leadership of the government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and form a federal military government. He continues, Accordingly, al Shehu Usman Shagari seizes forthwith to be the commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Nigeria. On the 1st of January 1984, the coup plotters announced Major General Buhari as the head of state. Major General Tunde Idiagbo was appointed his deputy with the designation Chief of Staff, Supreme Headquarters. Babangida, who was a brain of the coup, Babangida was the main, was the main brain behind the coup. You know, as the main brain behind the coup, now you'll be given that precious office to calm you down. So Babangida was announced as the chief of army staff. Why General Domkat Bali was made the chief of defense staff. Story has it that General Bali wanted to be chief of army staff. But Buhari told him that was the position Babangida wanted because Donkat Bali was, the, was a senior officer. He was higher in rank to, to Babangida. So he said, I want to be the chief of army staff. The chief of army staff is more powerful than the chief of defense staff because the chief of army staff controls the army directly. You know, he controls the army. He's the boss of the army. But Buhari said, no, bro. That position has been reserved for Babangida. You know, one would think that the chief of defense staff should be more powerful. That's on paper. The chief of army staff is the Coco. You can see Buhari left Buratai there. <laughs> left to Buhari 
He would not have retired Buddha Thai. It was the pressure that we mounted. He left him there. It was either he was retiring other people, but the chief of army staff is key. The way Lagbaja is key to Tinubu. With the powers of the office, with the power of that office of the chief of army staff, Babangida bloodlessly and quietly removed Buhari from power. <laughs> you know, after two years, they said this Buhari, that's you guys, this guy to do. They remove him quietly and they placed him under house arrest. Let me bring in Chief Tola Adeni again. He's the analyst on this show. He talks about Bako and the clique. After Bako had been killed um, the, and, uh, Babang, and uh, Buhari was made head of state, he would have been the head of state because he was, he was the leader of the coup. He was the most senior. He was the one who went to actually to, to uh, cause the uh, uh, Shagarian to arrest him. So uh, Bako was killed. If Bako had not been killed, Bako probably would have been the head of state. And then they had a compromise uh, candidacy in uh, Buhari. And I think, if my re recollection is correct, it, it, it was at that point in time planned or, or arranged that certain characters will take over from Bako after four years, another will take over from that person, another will take over from that person. And that uh, if Christians uh, made the noise, then the Christian. Uh, like Dogunyaro would take over in the in the uh, 14th year or 12th year to run to 16th year. Uh, let me get it clear. Yes. Was it that Buhari was going to rule for four years, then Babangida four years, and then Abacha four years? Yes, something like that. State Affairs with Edmond Obilo is live. So as we round off, Let's open our minds. Buhari, having participated in previous coups, was no longer, was no stranger to the intrigues and betrayers for power's sake. It meant that Buhari was appointed military governor of Bonu State by the Mortala Obasanjo government after they removed the government of General Gowon in 1975. So they gave him that position to compensate him for being part of the coup. He would later be made the Minister of Petroleum. You know, Fela, Fela did a song, 2.8 billion naira. Why money is still missing? You know, they set up inquiry. Inquiry don't close you. He was talking about Muhammad Buhari there. On becoming head of state, Buhari launched a crackdown on corruption. He was soon to fall out with his military colleagues that brought him to power. In a parlor school, Babangida and the prominent gang of coupists booted Buhari out on the 27th of August, 1985. Babangida, in his inaugural address, gave reasons why Buhari was overthrown. He said Buhari was too rigid and uncompromising in his attitude to issues of national significance. He said efforts to make Buhari understand that a diverse polity like Nigeria required recognition of and appreciation of differences in both cultural and individual perceptions did not fly. So the only option was to get him out before he furthers national disunity. Chief Tola Adeni talks about the overthrow of Buhari. So after this interview with Chief Adeni, I would round off the show. So here we want to look at how Buhari became a name that his colleagues in the military then want again within the system. Chief Tola Adeni on State Affairs. Not that I knew these things are these things are not documented. I could have known. I'm not. I wasn't a military guy. I wasn't in the military. You remember you were at a polytechnic in Abiokucha? Yes, I was there. What did you say there? I was a guest speaker, and I because uh, of the noise being made here and there that, and I quote myself that, just and gentlemen, that you shouldn't be surprised if you hear again, I brigadier Sonabacha. What were you trying to tell the students? 
that probably we have not come to the full stop that what we had was just a comma and that another military personnel could intervene and overthrow Buhari at that point in time. Chief Adeni, you were an instrument in the hands of some members of the political class and the military to overthrow General Muhammad Buhari. No, I wasn't an instrument. I couldn't have been an instrument. How could I have been an instrument? I was just a common, simple journalist uh, with a lot of political vivor, journalists with a lot of activism, but I couldn't have been an instrument. In Remember the, the pen is mightier than the sword. Yes, yeah, so if it was the pen, yes, my pen could campaign for overthrow of a government. My pen could campaign, could, could, could initiate or engineer a revolt. But not that I uh, was instrument in the hands of any, of, any, of any political class. I couldn't have been. Did you write against Buhari? Incidentally, no. I mean, I was a columnist in Punch. Even when he detained my friend, Al Rashid Ar Aruna Damu, and uh, another friend, I could only appeal to him. And um, I didn't support Decree 4 at that time, but I was not particularly uh, antagonistic to Buhari, even when it was, uh, when it was said. I cannot recollect any of my articles in Punch then, when I was a columnist. Uh, openly or blatantly attacking Buhari. You are an acidic writer. Yes, I've always been. Why didn't you attack Buhari as a military head of state? When, we, 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 you know, when, he, took, when he took over, Nigeria was disenchanted with the NPN government. And I was disenchanted with the NPN government. And I gave that party and the political class at that point in time hell in the kind of things I was writing in the Tribune. It's really my column till death do us part. You know, six columns a week on that on that title. With other, with other two other columns, I was writing eight, eight columns every week, attacking MPN and being very acidic, as to use your word. So when Buhari then took over, we thought that things were going to be normalized and that a new phase of life was you know was coming up, and Nigeria had. Uh, a new lease of life. So I did not do anything uh, for the. I was. I, I wrote all the time. It was it was it was out of state. Eighty four, eighty five. I was a columnist in Punch. But how come you were not angry in nineteen seventy nine? You worked with the UPN. I worked with the. I worked with the. I worked with the Tribune. Uh, but but you, you were the UPN for some time. That was in 78, yes. I worked with UPN in 78. Okay, in 78, yes, when I not 79. Out. No, 78, 78. 78. So you, you were part of the publicity uh, network of yes, the party I was, at the I time. Was, I was deputy or you know, special assistant to Chief M. Sika Jilichuku, my boss. And I can we say, when Buhari took over, he arrested the governors of the UPN. Yes, he did. Governors you had sympathy for. Certainly. And these governors wanted Buhari out, right? They did, yes. Why did they want Buhari out? The Bola, I guess. They, they were fed up with what they considered to be injustice. They thought that if MPN was the, the failure of MPN was the trigger for the overthrow of the MPN government, of child government, why should the, the UPN also be, you know, uh, rough handled? And uh, so they certainly didn't feel comfortable with Buhari as head of state. Did they reach out to you? Uh, I wouldn't know. I mean, I, I visited them. I visited some of them in prison. What did they tell you? What they told me was that they are not happy. And, and if you are in their shoes, you will also have told me the same. They wanted Buhari out. Even if they wanted Buhari out, which they didn't hide, I would have been able to influence that. So I would have been able to affect that. You have the pen. And you had the connection. I had connections. Your friends were in the military. Yes, they, they were. Abacha was your friend. Babangida was your friend. Yes. So, did you take any message to Babangida and Abacha? I don't think I will answer that question. I don't think... I, I wouldn't know. I, I certainly wouldn't answer whether I, I took a message. No one sent me on an errand to Babangida. Remember, you knew that Buhari was going to be overthrown. I suspected, given the sixth sense, given my experience, that it was not, not likely to last. And you knew IBB was going to be the next head of state, right? 
I didn't know who was going to be head of state, but I knew that um, among those left after Bako had been killed and after Buhari had taken over, the next most obvious person to succeed in would have been Babangida. State Affairs with Edmond Obilo is live. Yes, so let's leave it at that. Let's leave it at that. There's more to say, but I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. So, the books you should read to broaden your understanding of history. This House Has Fallen, Nigeria in Crisis by Karl Meyer. Get this book on udarabooks.com. This House Has Fallen by Karl Meyer. Good book. Good book. It's about the military, about Nigeria's democracy, about the war. Why we struck? Why we struck by Ademola Ademoyega? Why we struck? Why they plotted the first coup? You see? Read this book. You get it on udarabooks.com. Or contact us on WhatsApp. The numbers are on the screen. Contact Udara Books on WhatsApp. Udara Books and State Affairs are one. Ooh, they are one. Okay? They are linked. Udara Books, State Affairs. Someday I will tell you, you know, Babangda of true Buhari, but some other officers wanted to take Buhari, uh, Babangida out. You must have heard of the Okaku, the Gideon Okaku. You want to read about the coup? Say this book. Exploitation and Instability in Nigeria, the Okaku in Perspective, written by Sowaribi Tulafari. Sowaribi Tulafari was one of the guys who were part of the coup. In fact, he led the coup from the Ibado end, and he was one of those who, su who survived. You know, Babangira and Abacha arrested most of them, but he survived. Oboru, Oboru survived. Oboru was the financier. Of the coup. Oh, it's a classic work. I don't know why this book is not that popular, but I need to popularize it. I've, I've been able to get about 30 copies from the publishers. So, read this work, Exploitation and Instability in Nigeria. And the last book I'm recommending to you is Why Nations Fail. Darren Asemeglu and Robinson. Why Nations Fail, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty. So you can get these books on udarabooks.com. And one book I told you you need to read too is Military in Leadership in Nigeria, 1966 to 1970, written by Major General James Olule. You see the book? I told you the old book. But very incisive. Dikbo Adewumi, thank you for joining the broadcast. Thank you, Dikbo. You said I'm enjoying the highly insightful class. Thank you. Camellius Okweji says this program is rich in wisdom. Thank you. Even Green, I've been your faithful follower since my days in Ibadan, over 12 years ago. I never miss your morning radio show. Now you don't just have to wait for Saturday anymore. We have the State Affairs studio now. So you can join us on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 2 p.m. West African time. Rahim Aziz says, great work. Thank you. Okay, in your lakuka. Thank you for joining the broadcast. Thank you, guys. And make sure you enjoy your holiday. Read a book this holiday. Don't just sleep. Read. Reading opens the mind. Shukbon. I thank you, Ben Chidi. Okuru Donchuku Izundu. Thank you, Julius. If I need confidence, we appreciate you. So my team and I appreciate you. Ayo Ashimolo. Tosin. Ayeni Oladele. Miriam Giwa. Samuel Kalu. Together, we are saying... Have a beautiful weekend. I am Edmund Obilo.